The Life, The Times and The Death of an Irish High King, Cormac McCart. The following tales about King Cormac McCart are all taken from T.W. Rolleston's The High Deeds of Finn and Other Bardic Romances of Ancient Ireland, which is available for free download from the Resources tab over on BrehenLawAcademy.ie. Description of Cormac A noble and illustrious king assumed the sovereignty and rule of Erin, namely Cormac, grandson of Khan of the Hundred Battles. The world was full of all goodness in his time. There were fruit and fatness of the land, and abundant produce of the sea, with peace and ease and happiness. There were no killings or plunderings in his time, but everyone occupied his land in happiness. The nobles of Ireland assembled to drink at the banquet of Tara with Cormac at a certain time. Magnificently did Cormac come to this great assembly, for no man, his equal in beauty, had preceded him, except in Canary Moor, or Connor, son of Caffa, or Angus Og of the Dagda. Splendid indeed was Cormac's appearance in that assembly. His hair was slightly curled and of a golden colour, a scarlet shield he had, with engraved devices and golden bosses and ridges of silver. A wide, folding purple cloak was on him with a gem-set gold brooch over his breast, a golden torque round his neck, a white-coloured shirt embroidered with gold was on him, a girdle with golden buckles and studded with precious stones was around him, two golden network sandals with golden buckles upon his feet, two spears with golden sockets and many red bronze rivets in his hand, while he stood in the full glow of beauty without defect or blemish. You would think it was a shower of pearls that were set in his mouth, his lips were rubies, his symmetrical body was as white as snow, his cheek was ruddy as the berry of the mountain ash, his eyes were like the slow, his brows and eyelashes were like the sheen of a blue-black lance. The Birth of Cormac MacArt Of all the kings that ruled over Ireland, none had a better and more loyal servant than was Finn McCool and of all the captains and counsellors of kings, none ever served a more glorious and a nobler monarch than did Finn for the time that he served Cormac, son of Art, son of Con of the Hundred Battles. At the time at which this monarch lived and reigned, the mist of sixteen centuries hangs between us and the history of Ireland. But through this mist there shine a few great and sun-like figures whose glory cannot be altogether hidden, and of these figures Cormac is the greatest and the brightest. Much that is told about him may be true, and much is certainly fable, but the fables themselves are a witness to his greatness. They are like forms seen in the mist when a great light is shining behind it, and we cannot always say when we are looking at the true light, and when we are looking at the reflected glory. The birth of Cormac was on this wise. His father, as we have said, was Art, son of Con, and his mother was named Acta being the daughter of a famous smith or ironworker of Connacht. Now, before the birth of Cormac, Octa had a strange dream, namely that her head was struck off from her body, and that out of her neck there grew a great tree which extended its branches all over Ireland and flourished exceedingly. But a huge wave of the sea burst upon it and laid it low. Then, from the roots of this tree, there grew up another, but it did not attain the splendour of the first, and a blast of wind came from the west and overthrew it. On this the woman started from her sleep, and she woke her husband Art, and told him her vision. It is a true dream, said Art. I am thy head, and this portends that I shall be violently taken from thee. But thou shalt bear me a son, who shall be king of all Ireland, and shall rule with great power and glory, until some disaster from the sea overtakes him. But from him shall come yet another king, my grandson, and thine, who shall also be cut down, and I think that the cause of his fall shall be the armies of the Fian host, who are swift and keen as the wind. Not long thereafter, Art, son of Con, fell in battle with the Picts and Britons at the plain of the Swine, which is between Attenroy and Galway in Connacht. Now the leaders of the invaders then was Macon, a nephew to Art, who had been banished out of Ireland for rising against the High King, and when he had slain Art, he seized the sovereignty of Ireland and reigned there unlawfully for many years. But before the battle, Art had counselled his wife. 
If things go ill with us in the fight and I am slain, seek out my faithful friend Luna who dwells in Corin and Connacht, and he will protect thee till thy son be born. So Akta, with one maid, fled in her chariot before the host of Machan and sought to go to the dune of Luna. On her way hither, however, the hour came when her child should be born, and the maid turned the chariot aside into the wild wood of the place called Creva, the place of the twigs. And there, on a couch of twigs and leaves, she gave birth to a noble son. Then Akta, when she had cherished her boy and rejoiced over him, bade her handmaid keep watch over both of them, and they fell asleep. But the maid's eyes were heavy with weariness on long travelling, and ere long she too was overpowered by slumber, and all three slept a deep sleep while the horses wandered away grazing through the wood. By and by there came a she-wolf, roaming through the wood in search of prey for her whelps, and it came upon the sleeping woman and the little child. It did not wake the woman, but very softly it picked up the infant and bore it off to the stony cave that is hard by to Creva in the hill that was afterwards called Mount Cormac. After a while the mother waked up and found her child gone. Then she uttered a lamentable cry and woke her handmaid, and both the women searched hither and thither, but no trace of the child could they find. And thus Luna found them, for he had heard news of the battle and the death of his king, and he had come to succour Acta as he had pledged his word to do. Luna and his men also made search for the infant, but in vain, and at last he conveyed the two sorrowing women to his palace. But Akta remembered her prophetic dream and was somewhat comforted. Luna then proclaimed that whoever should discover the king's son, if he were yet alive, might claim of him what reward he would. And so the time passed till one day a man, Greg, a clansman of Luna, the lord of Corin, as he ranged the woods hunting, came on a stony cavern in the side of a hill, and before it he saw wolf cubs at play, and among them a naked child on all fours, gambolling with them and a great she-wolf that mothered them all. Right, cried Greg, and off he goes to Luna, his lord. What wilt thou give me for the king's son, said he. What wilt thou have, said Luna. So Greg asked for certain lands, and Luna bound himself to give them to him and to his posterity, and there lived and flourished the clan Gregor for many a generation to come. So Luna, guided by Greg, went to the cave on Mount Cormac, and took the child and the wolf cubs all together and brought them home. And the child they called Cormac, or the chariot child. Now the lad grew up very comely and strong, and he abode with Luna in Connacht, and no one told him of his true descent. The Judgment of Cormac Once upon a time it happened that Cormac was at play with the two sons of Luna, and the lads grew angry in their play and came to blows and Cormac struck one of them to the ground. Sorrow on it, cried the lad. Here I have been beaten by one that knows not his clan or kindred, save that he is a fellow without a father. When Cormac heard that he was troubled and ashamed, and he went to Luna and told him what had been said. And Luna, seeing the trouble of the youth, and also that he was strong and noble to look on, and wise and eloquent in speech, held that the time was now come to reveal to him his descent. Thou hadst indeed a clan and kindred, he said, and a father of the noblest, for thou art the son of Art, the high king of Ireland, who was slain and dispossessed by Macon. But it is foretold that thou shalt yet come to thy father's place, and the land pines for thee, even now, for there is no good yield from earth or sea under the unlawful rule of him who now sits on the throne of Art. If that be so, said Cormac, let us go to Tara, and bide our time there in my father's house. So the two of them set out for Tara on the morrow morn, and this the retinue they had with them, a bodyguard of outlawed men that had revolted against Macon and other lords and had gathered themselves together at Koran under Luna, and four wolves that had been cubs with Cormac when the she-wolf suckled him. When they came to Tara, the folk there wondered at the fierce-eyed warriors and the grey beasts that played like dogs around Cormac and the lad was adopted as a pupil by the king to be taught arms and poetry and law. Much talk there was of his coming and of his strange companions that are not wont to be the friends of man, and as the lad grew in comeliness and knowledge, the eyes of all were turned to him more and more, because the rule of Macon was not a good one. So time wore on, 
till one day a case came for judgment before the king, in which the queen sued a certain wealthy woman and an owner of herds named Benna, for that the sheep of Benna had strayed into the queen's fields and had eaten to the ground a crop of woad that was growing there. The king gave judgment that the sheep which had eaten the woad were to be given to the queen in compensation for what they had destroyed. Then Cormac rose up before the people and said, Nay, but let the wool of the sheep, when they are next shorn, be given to the queen, for the woad will grow again, and so shall the wool. A true judgment, a true judgment, cried all the folk that were present in the place. A very king's son is he that had pronounced it. And they murmured so loudly against Macon that his druids counselled him to quit Tara, lest a worse thing befall him. So he gave up the sovereignty to Cormac, and went southward into Munster to rally his friends there and recover the kingdom. And there he was slain by Cormac's men, as he was distributing great largesse of gold and silver to his followers in the place called the Field of Gold. So Cormac, son of Art, ruled in Tara and was High King of all Ireland, and the land, it is said, knew its rightful lord, and yielded harvests such as were never known, while the forest trees dripped with the abundance of honey and the lakes and rivers were alive with fish. So much game was there, too, that the folk could have lived on that alone and never put a ploughshare in the soil. In Cormac's time, the autumn was not vexed with rain, nor the spring with icy winds, nor the summer with parching heat, nor the winter with whelming snows. His rule in Erin, it is said, was like a wand of gold laid on a dish of silver. Also he rebuilt the ramparts at Tara and made it strong, and he enlarged the great banqueting hall and made pillars of cedar in it, ornamented with plates of bronze, and painted its lime-white walls in patterns of red and blue. Palaces for the women he also made there, and storehouses and halls for the fighting men. Never was Tara so populous or so glorious before or since, and for his wisdom and righteousness, Knowledge was given to him that none other in Ireland had as yet, for it was revealed to him that the immortal ones who the Gael worshipped were but the names of one whom none can name, and that his message should ere long come to Ireland from over the eastern sea, calling the people to a sweeter and diviner fate. And to the end of his life it was his way to have wolves about him, for he knew their speech, and they his, and they were friendly and tame with him and his folk, since they were foster brothers together in the wild wood. Cormac sets up the first mill in Erin. During the reign of Cormac it happened that some of the lords of Ulster made a raid upon the Picts in Alba and brought home many captives. Among them was a Pictish maiden named Kiernit, daughter of a king of that nation, who was strangely beautiful, and for that the Ulstermen sent her as a gift to King Cormac and Cormac gave her as a household slave to his wife Etna, who set her to grinding corn with a hand kern, as women in Erin were used to do. One day as Cormac was in the palace of the queen, he saw Kiernit labouring at her task and weeping as she wrought, for the toil was heavy and she was unused to it. Then Cormac was moved with compassion for the women that ground corn throughout Ireland, and he sent to Alba for artificers to come over and set up a mill, for up to then... There were no mills in Ireland. Now, there was in Tara, as there is to this day, a well of water called the Purley, for the purity and brightness of the water that sprang from it. And it ran in a stream down the hillside, as it still runs, but now only in a slender trickle. Over this stream, Cormac bade them build the first mill that was in Ireland, and the bright water turned the wheel merrily round, and the women in Tara toiled at the kern no more. The Instructions of the King Cormac's wife Etna bore to Cormac a son, her firstborn, named Carberry, who was king of Ireland after Cormac. It was during the lifetime of Cormac that Carberry came to the throne, for it happened that ere he died, Cormac was wounded by a chance cast of a spear and lost one of his eyes, and it was forbidden that any man having a blemish should be a king in Ireland. Cormac therefore gave up the kingdom into the hands of Carberry, before he did so, he told his son all the wisdom that he had in the governing of men. And this was written down in a book which was called The Instructions of Cormac. These are among the things which are found in it of the wisdom of Cormac. Let him, the king, restrain the great. Let him exalt the good. Let him establish peace. Let him plant law. Let him protect the just. 
Let him bind the unjust. Let his warriors be many and his counsellors few. Let him shine in company and be the son of the mead hall. Let him punish with a full fine wrong done knowingly and with a half fine wrong done in ignorance. Carberry said, What are good customs for a tribe to pursue? They are as follows, Cormac replied. To have frequent assemblies, to be ever inquiring, to question the wise men, to keep order in assemblies, to follow ancient lore, not to crush the miserable, to keep faith in treaties, to consolidate kinship, fighting men not to be arrogant, to keep contracts faithfully, to guard the frontiers against every ill. Tell me, O Cormac, said Carberry, what are good customs for the giver of a feast? And Cormac said, to have lighted lamps, to be active in entertaining the company, to be liberal in dispensing ale, to tell stories briefly, to be of joyous countenance, and to keep silence during recitals. Tell me, O Cormac, said his son once, what were thy habits when thou wert a lad? And Cormac said, I was a listener in the woods, I was a gazer at stars, I pried into no man's secrets, I was mild in the hall, I was fierce in the fray, I was not given to making promises. I referenced the aged. I spoke ill of no man in his absence. I was fonder of giving than of asking. If you listen to my teaching, said Cormac, do not deride any old person though you be young, nor any poor man though you be rich, nor any naked though you be well clad, nor any lame though you be swift, nor any blind though you be keen-sighted, nor any invalid though you be robust nor any dull though you be clever, nor any fool though you be wise. Yet be not slothful, nor fierce, nor sleepy, nor niggardly, nor feckless, nor envious, for all these are hateful before God and men. Do not join in blasphemy, nor be the butt of an assembly. Be not moody in an alehouse and never forget a tryst. What are the most lasting things on earth? asked Carberry. Not hard to tell, said Cormac. They are grass copper and a yew tree. If you will listen to me, said Cormac, this is my instruction for the management of your household and your realm. Let not a man with many friends be your steward, nor a woman with sons and foster sons your housekeeper, nor a greedy man your butler, nor a man of much delay your miller, nor a violent, fell-melted man your messenger, nor a grumbling sluggard your servant, nor a talkative man your counsellor, nor a tippler, your cupbearer, nor a short-sighted man, your watchman, nor a bitter, haughty man, your doorkeeper, nor a tender-hearted man, your judge, nor an ignorant man, your leader, nor an unlucky man, your counsellor. Such were the counsels that Cormac MacArthur gave to his son Carberry, and Carberry became king after his father's abdication, and reigned seven and twenty years, till he and Oscar, son of Usheen, slew one another at the Battle of Gowra. A Pleasant Story of Cormac's Brehan Among other affairs which Cormac regulated for himself and all kings who should come after him was the number and quality of the officers who should be in constant attendance on the king. Of these he ordained that there should be ten, to wit one lord, one brehan, one druid, one physician, one bard, one historian, one musician, and three stewards. The function of the brehan or judge was to know the ancient customs of the laws of Ireland and to declare them to the king whenever any matter relating to them came before him. Now Cormac's chief brehan was at first one Fihil, but Fihil's time came to die, and his son Flahery, a wise and learned man trained by his father in all the laws of the Gael, was to be brehan to the high king in his father's stead. Fihil then called his son to his bedside and said, Thou art well acquainted, my son, with all the laws and customs of the Gael and worthy to be chief brehan of King Cormac. But wisdom of life thou hast not yet obtained, for it is written in no law book. This thou must learn for thyself, for life itself, yet somewhat of it I can impart unto thee, and will keep thee in the path of safety, which is not easily trodden by those who are in the councils of great kings. Mark now these four precepts, and obey them, and thou wilt avoid many the pitfalls in thy way. Take not a king's son in fosterage. Impart no dangerous secret to thy wife. 
Raise not the son of a serf to a high position. Commit not thy purse or treasure to a sister's keeping. Having said this, Fihil died, and Flattery became chief Breton in his stead. After a time, Flattery thought to himself, I am minded to test my father's wisdom of life and to see if it be true wisdom or but wise seeming babble, for knowledge is no knowledge until it be tried by life. So he went before the king and said, If thou art willing, Cormac, I would gladly have one of thy sons in fosterage. At this Cormac was well pleased, and a young child of the sons of Cormac was given to Flattery to bring up, and Flattery took the child to his own dune, and there began to nurture and to train him as it was fitting. After a time, however, Flattery one day took the child by the hand and went with him into the deep recesses of the forest, where dwelt one of the swine herds who minded the swine of Flattery. To him, Flattery handed over the child and bade him guard him as the apple of his eye, and to be ready to deliver him up again when he was required. The Flattery went home and for some days went about like a man weighed down by his gloomy and bitter thoughts. His wife marked that and sought to know the reason, but Flattery put her off. At last, when she continually pressed him to reveal the cause of his trouble, he said, If them must needs learn what ails me, and if thou canst keep a secret full of danger to me and thee, know that I am gloomy and distraught because I have killed the son of Cormac. At this the woman cried out, Murderer! Parricide, hast thou spilled the king's blood, and shall Cormac not know it, and do justice on thee? And she sent word to Cormac that he should come and seize her husband for that crime. But before the officers came, Flattery took a young man, the son of his butler, and placed him in charge of his lands to manage them, while Flattery was away for his trial at Tara. And he also gave to his sister a treasure of gold and silver to keep for him, lest it should be made a spoil of while he was absent. Then he went with the officers to Tara, denying his offence and his confession. When Cormac had heard all, and the child could not be found, he sentenced him to be put to death. Flaherty then sent a message to his sister, begging her to send him at once a portion of the treasure he had left with her, that he might use it to make himself friends among the folk at court, and perchance obtain a remission of his sentence. But she sent the messenger back again, empty, saying she knew not of what he spoke. On this Flattery deemed that the time was come to reveal the truth, so he obtained permission from the king to send a message to his swineherd before he died, and to hear the man's reply. The message was this, that Murchtok the herd should come without delay to Tara and bring with him the child that Flattery had committed to him. Howbeit, this messenger also came back empty, and reported that on reaching Dune Flattery, he had been met by the butler's son that was over the estate who had questioned him of his errand and had then said, Murtok the serf had run away as soon as he heard of his lord's downfall, and if he had any child in his care he had taken it away with him, and he cannot be found. This he said because, on hearing of the child, he guessed what this might mean, and he had been the bitterest of all in urging Flattery's death, hoping to be rewarded with a share of his lands. Then Flattery said to himself, Truly the proving of my father's wisdom of life has brought me very near to death. So he sent for the king and entreated him, that he might be suffered to go himself to the dwelling of Murtok, promising that the king's son should then be restored to him. Or if not, said he, let me then be slain there without more ado. With great difficulty Cormac was moved to consent to this, for he believed it was but a subterfuge of Flaherty's, to put off the evil day, or perchance to find a way of escape. But next day, Flaherty was straightly bound and set in a chariot, and with a guard of spearmen about him, and Cormac himself riding behind, they set out for Doom Flattery. Then Flattery guided them through the wild wood till at last they came to the clearing where stood the dwelling of Murtok, the swineherd, and lo, there was the son of Cormac playing merrily before the door. And the child ran to his foster father to kiss him. But when he saw Flattery in bonds, he burst out weeping and would not be at peace until he was set free. Then Murtok slew one of the boars of his herd and made an oven in the earth after the manner of the fina, and made over it a fire of bows that he had drying in a shed. And when the boar was baked, he set it before the company with ale and mead in methers of beechwood, and they all feasted and were glad of heart. Cormac then asked Flattery why he had suffered himself to be brought into this trouble. I did so, said Flaherty, to prove the four counsels which my father gave them ere he died, and I have proved them and found them to be wise. In the first place, 
It is not wise for any man that is not a king to take the fosterage of a king's son. For if aught shall happen to the lad, his own life is in the king's hands, and with his life he shall answer for it. Secondly, the keeping of a secret, said my father, is not in the nature of women in general, therefore no dangerous secret should be entrusted to them. The third counsel my father gave me was not to raise up or enrich the son of a serf, for such persons are apt to forget benefits conferred on them, and moreover it irks them that he who raised them up should know the poor estate from which they sprang. And good, too, is the fourth counsel my father gave me, not to entrust my treasure to my sister, for it is the nature of most women to regard as spoil any valuables that are entrusted to them to keep for others. The Judgment Concerning Cormac's Sword When Cormac, son of Art, son of Connacht the Hundred Battles, was High King in Erin, great was the peace and splendour of his reign, and no provincial king or chief in any part of the country lifted up his head against Cormac. At his court in Tara were many noble youths who were trained up there in all matters befitting their rank and station. One of these youths was named Socht, son of Fihl. Socht had a wonderful sword named the Hard-Headed Stealing, which was said to have been long ago the sword of Cúchulain. It had a hilt of gold and a belt of silver, and its point was double-edged. At night it shone like a candle. If its point were bent all the way back to the hilt, it would fly back again and be as straight as before. If it was held in running water and a hair were floated down against the edge, it would sever the hair. It was a saying that this sword would make two halves of a man and for a while he would not perceive what had befallen him. This sword was held by Socht for a tribal possession from his father and grandfather. There was at this time a famous steward to the High King in Tara whose name was Dovdrin. This man asked Socht to sell him the sword. He promised to Socht such a ration as he, Dovdrin, had every night and four men's food for the family of Socht, and, after that, Socht to have the full value of the sword at his own appraisement. No, said Socht. I may not sell my father's treasures while he is alive. And thus they went on, Dovdren's mind ever running on the sword. At last he bade Sok to a drinking bout and plied him with so much wine and mead that Sok became drunken and knew not where he was and finally fell asleep. Then the steward takes the sword and goes to the king's brazier by the name of Conu. Art thou able, says Dovdren, to open the hilt of this sword? I am that, said the brazier. Then the brazier took apart the hilt, and within, upon the tang of the blade, he wrote the steward's name. He wrote the steward's name, Dovdrin, and the steward laid the sword again by the side of Socht. So it was for three months after that, and the steward continued to ask Socht to sell him the sword, but he could not get it from him. Eventually the steward brought a suit for the sword before the High King, and he claimed that it was his own, and that it had been taken from him. But Socht declared that the sword was his by long possession and by equity, and he would not give it up. Then Socht went to his father, Fihl, the Brehan, and begged him to take part in the action and to defend the claim. But Fihl said, Nay, thou art too apt to blame the pleadings of other men. Plead for thyself. So the court was set, and Socht was called on to prove that the sword was his. He swore that it was a family treasure, and thus it had come down to him. The steward said, Well, O Cormac, the oath that Socht has uttered is a lie. What proof hast thou of that? asked Cormac. Not hard to declare, replied the steward. If the sword be mine, my name stands grave therein, concealed within the hilt of the sword. That will soon be known, said Cormac, and therewith he had the brazier summoned. The brazier comes and breaks open the hilt, and the name of Dovdrin stands written within it. Thus a dead thing testified in law against a living man. Then Socht said, Hear ye, O men of Erin and Cormac the king, I acknowledge that this man is the owner of the sword. And to Dovdren he said, The property therein, and all the obligations of it pass from me to thee. Dovdren said, I acknowledge property in the sword, and all its obligations. Then Socht said, This sword was found in the neck of my grandfather Angus, and till this day it was never known who had done that murder. Do justice, O king, for this crime, said the king to Dovdren. Thou art liable for more than the sword is worth. So he awarded to Socht the price of seven bondwomen as blood fine for the slaying of Angus and restitution of the sword to Socht. Then the steward confessed the story of the sword, and Cormac levied seven other cools from the brazier. 
But Cormac said, This is, in truth, the sword of Cúchulain, and by it was slain my grandfather, even Con of the Hundred Battles, at the hands of the King of Ulster, of whom it is written, With a host, with a valiant band, well did he go into Connacht, alas that he saw the blood of Con on the side of Cúchulain's sword. Then Cormac and Fihil agreed that the sword be given to Cormac as a blood fine for the death of Con, and his it was. And it was the third best of the royal treasures that were in Erin, namely Cormac's cup that broke if a falsehood were spoken over it and became whole if a truth were spoken over it, and the bell branch that he got in Fairyland, whose music, when it was shaken, would put the sleep-wounded men and women in travail, and the sword of Cúchulain, against which and against the man that held it in his hand, no victory could ever be won. The Disappearance of Cormac In the Chronicle of the Kings of Ireland that was written by Tierna, the historian, in the 11th century after Christ's coming, there is noted down in the annals of the year 248, the disappearance of Cormac, grandson of Con, for seven months. That which happened to Cormac during these seven months is told in one of these bardic stories of Ireland being the story of Cormac's journey to Fairyland, and this was the manner of it. One day Cormac, son of Art, was looking over the ramparts of his royal doon of Tara, when he saw a young man, glorious to look on in his person and his apparel, coming towards him across the plain of Bregia. The young man bore in his hand, as it were, a branch from which hung nine golden bells formed like apples. When he shook the branch, the nine apples beat against each other and made music, so sweet that there was no pain or sorrow in the world that a man would not forget while he hearkened to it. Does this branch belong to thee? asked Cormac of the youth. Truly it does, replied the youth. Will thou sell it to me? said Cormac. I never had aught that I would not sell for a price, said the young man. What is thy price? asked Cormac. The price shall be what I will, said the young man. I will give thee whatever thou desirest of all that is mine, said Cormac, for he coveted the branch exceedingly and the enchantment was heavy upon him. So the youth gave him the bell branch, and then said, My price is thy wife, and thy son, and thy daughter. Then they went together into the palace, and found there Cormac's wife and his children. That is a wonderful jewel thou hast in thy hand, Cormac, said Etna. It is, said Cormac, and great is the price I have paid for it. What is the price, said Etna? Even thou and thy children twain, said the king. Never hast thou done such a thing, cried Etna, as to prefer any treasure in the world before us three. And they all three lamented and implored, but Cormac shook the branch and immediately their sorrow was forgotten. And they went away willingly with the young man across the plain of Bregia, until a mist hid them from the eyes of Cormac. And when the people murmured and complained against Cormac, for Etna and her children were much beloved of them, Cormac shook the bell branch and their grief was turned into joy. A year went by after this, and then Cormac longed for his wife and children again, nor could the bell branch any longer bring him forgetfulness of them. So one morning he took the branch and went out alone from Tara, over the plain, taking the direction in which they had passed away a year ago. And ere long, little wreaths of mist began to curl about his feet, and then to flit by him like long trailing robes, and he knew no more where he was. After a time, however, he came out again into sunshine and clear sky, and found himself in a country of flowery meadows and of woods, filled with singing birds, where he had never journeyed before. He walked on, till at last he came to a great and stately mansion with a crowd of builders at work upon it, and they were roofing it with a thatch made of the wings of strange birds. But when they had half covered the house, their supply of feathers ran short, and they rode off in haste to seek for more. While they were gone, however, a wind arose and whirled away the feathers already laid on, so that the rafters were left bare as before. And this happened again and again, as Cormac gazed on them for he knew not how long. At last his patience left him and he said, I see with that ye have been doing this since the beginning of the world, and that ye will still be doing it in the end thereof. And with that he went on his way, and many other strange things he saw. Well, of them we say nothing now, till he came to the gateway of a great and lofty dune, where he entered in and asked hospitality. Then there came to him a tall man clad in a cloak of blue, that changed into silver or purple as its folds waved in the light, and with him was a woman more beautiful 
than the daughters of men, even she of whom it was said her beauty was of that of a tear when it drops from the eyelid. So crystal pure it was and bright. They greeted Cormac courteously and begged him to stay with them for the night. Cormac then entered a great hall with pillars of cedar and many coloured silken hangings. In the midst of it was a fireplace whereon the host threw a large log and shortly afterwards brought in a young pig which Cormac cut up to roast before the fire. He first put one quarter of the pig to roast and then his host said to him, Tell us a tale, stranger, and if it be a true one, the quarter will be done as soon as the tale is told. Do thou begin, said Cormac, and then thy wife, and after that my turn will come. Good, said the host, this is my tale. I have seven of these swine, and with their flesh the whole world could be fed. When one of them is killed and eaten, I need but put its bones into the pig trough, and on the morrow it is alive and well again. They looked at the fireplace, and behold, the first quarter of the pig was done and ready to be served. Then Cormac put on the second quarter, and the woman took up her tail. I have seven white cows, she said, and seven pails are filled with the milk of them each day. Though all the folk in the world were gathered together to drink of this milk, there would be enough and to spare for all. As soon as she had said that, they saw that the second quarter of the pig was roasted. Then Cormac said, I know you now, who you are, for it is Mananan that owns the seven swine of fairy, and it is out of the land of promise that he fetched Fand, his wife, and her seven cows. Then immediately the third quarter of the pig was done. Tell us now, said Mananan, who thou art and why thou art come hither. Cormac then told his story of the branch with its nine golden apples and how he had bartered for it his wife and his children and how he was now seeking them throughout the world. And when he had made an end, the last quarter of the pig was done. Come, let us set to the feast then, said Mananan. But Cormac said, Never have I sat down to meet in a company of two only. Nay, said Mananan, but there are more to come. With that he opened the door in the hall and it appeared, Queen Etna and her two children. And when they had embraced and rejoiced in each other, Mananan said, It was I who took them from thee, Cormac, and who gave thee the bell branch. For I wished to bring thee hither to be my guest for the sake of thy nobleness and thy wisdom. Then they all sat down at the table and feasted and made merry, and when they had satisfied themselves with meat and drink, Mananan showed the wonders of his household to King Cormac, and he took up a golden cup which stood on the table and said, this cup had a magical property, for if a lie be spoken over it, it will immediately break in pieces, and if a truth be spoken, it will be made whole again. Prove this to me, said Cormac. That is easily done, said Mananan. Thy wife had had a new husband since I carried her off from thee. Straight away the cup fell apart into four pieces. My husband has lied to thee, Cormac, said Fand, and immediately the cup became whole again. Cormac then began to question Mananan as to the things he had seen on his way hither, and he told him of the house that was being attached and the wings of the birds and of the men that kept returning ever and again to their work as the wind destroyed it. And Mananan said, These, O Cormac, are the men of art, who seek to gather together much money and gear of all kinds by the exercise of their craft, but as fast as they get it, so they spend it, or faster, and the result is that they will never be rich. But when he had said this, it is related that the golden cup broke into pieces where it stood. Then Cormac said, The explanation thou hast given of this mystery is not true. Mananan smiled and said, Nevertheless, it must suffice thee, O king, for the truth of this matter may not be known, lest men of art give over the roofing of the house and it be covered with common thatch. So when they had talked their fill, Cormac and his wife and children were brought to a chamber where they lay down to sleep. But when they woke up on the morrow morn, they found themselves in the Queen's chamber in the royal palace of Tara, and by Cormac's side were found the bell branch and the magical cup and the cloth of gold that had covered the table where they sat in the palace of Mananan. Seven months it was since Cormac had gone out from Tara to search for his wife and children, but it seemed to him that he had been absent, but for the space of a single day and night. The Death and Burial of King Cormac MacArthur Strange was the birth and childhood of Cormac, strange his life, and strange the manner of his death and burial, as we now have to narrate. Cormac, it is said, was the third man in Ireland who heard of the Christian faith before the coming of Patrick. One was Conor Macnessa, King of Ulster, 
who drew it told him of the crucifixion of Christ and who died of that knowledge. The second was the wise Judge Moran, and the third, Cormac, son of Art. This knowledge was revealed to him by divine illumination, and henceforth he refused to consult the Druids or to worship the images which they made as emblems of the immortal ones. One day it happened that Cormac, after he had laid down the kingship of Ireland, was present when the Druids and a concourse of people were worshipping the great golden image which was set up in the plain called Moislocht. When the ceremony was done, the chief Druid, whose name was Moilon, spoke to Cormac and said, Why, O Cormac, didst thou not bow down and adore the golden image of the god like the rest of the people? And Cormac said, Never will I worship a stock that my own carpenter has made, rather would I worship the man that made it, for he is nobler than the work of his hands. Then it is told that Moylan, by magic art, caused the image to move and leap before the eyes of Cormac. Seest thou that? said Moylan. Although I see, said Cormac, I will do no worship save to the God of heaven and earth and hell. Then Cormac went to his own home at Sletty on the Boyne, for there he lived after he had given up the kingdom to his son Carberry. But the Druids of Erin came together and consulted over this matter, and they determined solemnly to curse Cormac and invoke the vengeance of their gods upon him, lest the people should think that any man could despise and reject their gods and suffer no ill for it. So they cursed Cormac in his flesh and bones, in his waking and sleeping, in his down-sitting and his uprising, and each day they turned over the wishing stone upon the altar of their god and wove mighty spells against his life. And whether it was that these took effect, or that the druids prevailed upon some traitorous servant of Cormac's to work their will, so it was that he died not long thereafter. And some say that he was choked by a fish bone as he sat at meat in his house at Sletty on the Boyne. But when he felt his end approaching and had still the power to speak, he said to those that gathered round his bed, When I am gone I charge you that you bury me not at Brew of the Boyne, where is the royal cemetery of the kings of Erin. For all of these kings paid adoration to gods of wood or stone, or to the sun and the elements, whose signs are carved on the walls of their tombs. But I have learned to know the one God, immortal, invisible, by whom the earth and heavens were made. Soon there will come into Aaron one from the east who will declare him unto us, and then wooden gods and cursing priests shall plague us no longer in this land. Bury me then not at Bruna Boina, but on hither side of Boina at Rosnery, where there is a sunny eastward sloping hill. There I will await the coming of the Son of Truth. And there was a very great mourning for him in the land. But when the time came for his burial, the princes and lords of the Gael vowed that he should lie in brew with Art, his father, and Con of the Hundred Battles, his grandfather, and many other king, in the great stone chambers for the royal dead. For Rosnery, they said, is but a green hill of no note, and Cormac's expectation of the message of the new god they took to be but the wanderings of a dying man. Now Bruna Boyna lay at the farther side of the Boyne from Sletty, and nearby was a shallow ford where the river could be crossed. But when the funeral train came down to the ford, bearing aloft the body of the king, lo, the river had risen as though a tempest had burst upon it at its far-off sources in the hills, and between them and the farther bank was now a broad and foaming flood. Even so they made the trial of the ford, and thrice the bearers waded in, and thrice they were forced to turn back, lest the flood should sweep them down. At length six of the tallest mightiers of the warriors of the High King took up the boyer upon their shoulders and strode in. And first the watchers on the bank saw the brown water swirl about their knees, and then they sank thigh deep, and at last it foamed against their shoulders, yet still they braced themselves against the current, moving forward very slowly as they found foothold among the slippery rocks in the riverbed. But when they had almost reached the midstream, it seemed as if a great surge overwhelmed them and caught the beer from their shoulders as they plunged and clutched around it. And they must needs make back for the shore as best they could while Boyne swept the body of Cormac to the sea. On the following morning, however, shepherds driving their flocks to the pastures on the hillside of Rosnery 
found cast upon the shore the body of an aged man of noble countenance, half wrapped in a silken pall. And knowing not who this might be, they dug a grave in the grassy hill, and there laid the stranger, and laid the green sods over him again. There still sleeps Cormac the king, and neither ohm lettered stone nor sculptured cross marks his solitary grave, but he lies in the place where he would be, of which a poet of the gale in our days has written, A tranquil spot, a hopeful sound, comes from the ever youthful stream, and still on daisied mead and mound the dawn delays with tenderer beam. Round Cormac spring renews her buds, in March perpetual by his side. Down come the earth fresh April floods, and up the sea fresh salmon glide, and life and time rejoicing run, from age to age their wonted way. But still he waits the risen sun, for still tis only dawning day.